Well, the uh, first wave of migration came before the 1900s, and they consisted mainly of the uh, Chinese free settlers. There were no restrictions when they came. Some of them wanted to stay in Samoa after traveling the Pacific. Uh, others wanted to set up businesses. Probably others fell in love with the local girls. Usually, Chinese are mentioned in Samoan history as, this is when they arrived. And then it was like German, German, New Zealand administration, and then independence. But there's not a lot of materials. And I didn't grow up in an environment where that wasn't really like the sorts of conversations we had at the kitchen table. It was like, how's your homework? And you know what you do at school today? We didn't really think to ask, oh, so how, how come grandpa doesn't really speak, you know, that much Samoan? I mean, we, we realized that he's Chinese. The second wave of Chinese that came to Samoa, I would describe as the indentured laborers. So these were the Chinese mainly from the southern part of China. By the 1900s, uh, there were a lot of plantations in Samoa, mainly run by the uh, German uh, companies. And the Samoan people were, did not want to work in the plantations. Uh, so these German companies, they brought in the um, Solomon Islanders mainly. Our Malaysian brothers were brought over. And they uh, also looked at uh, China. And so that's why the Chinese uh, were brought over here. For the free settlers, you know, they came here on their own free will and were not tied by contract to anyone. Whereas the uh, indentured laborers, they came under contract and conditions of the contracts were very strict. Mainly the Chinese indentured laborers were required to work nine and a half hours a day. Flogging was allowed, and flogging can be for being lazy or for running away or for not bowing down low enough to the European uh, employers. When the Germans were here, there was a system of race separation. There were the whites, and then there were the half whites, and then the Samoans, and then the Chinese. And of course, we had our Melanesian brothers. When the New Zealand administration took over Samoa after the First World War, there were some laws that were passed to try and stop the uh, mingling of the Chinese with the Samoan. And there was even a law that was passed by the New Zealand government, which prohibited Chinese uh, men from marrying uh, Samoan girls. The first administrator had said the Chinese should not marry the local girls because that would uh, contaminate the Samoan blood, but it was okay for um, English men to marry the uh, Samoan girls as they were of Aryan stock. So I guess that's probably one reason why they had uh, passed such a uh, racist uh, legislation. So it specifically said endangered chi Chinese laborers, they were prohibited from entering any Samoan valley. If they were caught, they were fined about five pounds or something like that, and or go to prison for about six weeks and do hard labor. I get a little bit teary when I think of this part of the story. It's how um, I think some, some families were split. Like the Chinese who married Samoan women and had families, and so they, some of them were repatriated back to China. You know, it's like um, the dawn raids, kind of. I think that was one sad period uh, in Samoa's history, the forceful repatriation of the uh, Chinese indentured laborers, especially when some of them did not want to go back because some of them 
have married local girls or they even had children at the time, they were forced to go back to China. Uh, one Chinese man I heard uh, had to jump off the boat, swam back to Samoa, and his descendants are still here. Others had to hide in the plantations in the forest to avoid repatriation. When my great-grandfather asked Matafa, Matafa said, just go and hide. It's your court later, then I'll try and help. So yeah, so that's what had happened with my great-grandfather. Yeah, luckily he wasn't caught <laughs> and had, had a lot of friends. <laughs>